Thank you so much, sir, for those um, words. Thank you to the Observer Research Foundation. I hope I'm not being too loud. Is that okay? It, it's a little. Um, thanks to Kashish for the opening remarks, and of course, thanks to Daval for your eternal patience in uh, trying to get me here to Mumbai. So thanks for, for making this happen. It's a delight. This is my very first time in India. Um, uh, and uh, as you pointed out correctly, sir, Delhi was my first stop, uh, and I literally, I literally arrived in Mumbai half an hour ago. Uh, and you know, there's something unnerving about a pilot's announcement when he says, um, "We did not get permission to land, and we're running out of fuel." That 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 combination somehow. Uh, y you know, made me, uh, who usually, uh, you know, does a living by being calm and composed in front of the camera, I have to admit for a second, I was like, not landing, no fuel. Okay, let's see how this works out. So, um, I am here. I am here. So, uh, there is a happy end uh, to the story. I'm delighted to be here uh, in, in Mumbai, and I thank you to all of you for coming out, because I have to be honest, uh, if you schedule the talk, uh, any talk, not just to talk about the uh, refugee crisis, any talk in Germany at 5.30 p.m. on a Friday, uh, I don't know, maybe two cleaning ladies would show up. You know, this is, uh, everybody would be, are you kidding me? The weekend has begun, you know, solve your own damn refugee crisis. But, uh, so thank you, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, showing up, and indeed, um, this is, this is the most pressing issue right now that uh, Europe is facing. I would even go so far as to say this is the most pressing issue Europe has been facing since its foundations uh, post-World War II. Um, I will be brief because uh, I, I, you know, whenever I speak throughout the world, uh, for me, uh, the uh, fun part and the interesting part is to interact with the audience because, as you know, you hardly learn anything new when you're speaking yourself. So, uh, um, so I'm very much looking forward to your questions and, and to interacting with you. Maybe just a couple of, you know, uh, introductory remarks, and then we can hit it off right away with the Q and A. <clears throat> you know, it feels now not just because I'm a journalist and uh, my, you know, that I report on these things. It feels now that. For five years, we in Europe have been in a permanent state of crisis. Uh, and the worst of all is, every new crisis is worse than the previous one. So we always think this it can't get worse than this, right? The Euro crisis can't get worse than this. Greece is, you know, Portugal, Spain can't get worse than this. Well, guess what? Now we got the refugee crisis. Or we think, you know, Ukraine, Ukraine is the worst crisis. Now we have to face Russia again, you know, and yet uh, uh, the rise of xenophobic anti-EU uh, EU parties in our national parliaments is the next uh, big thing. So, you know, it, it really seems that for five years now, I would say five years, we in Europe cannot get out of this crisis mode, and it seems that, um, you know, the worst is we're hitting a new crisis without the previous one being solved. Uh, and this is really the state that we're in right now. But I would say um, the euro crisis, uh, our common currency crisis, uh, even though it has no longer dominating the headlines, is far from being resolved. It has just been sort of put aside due to the most pressing and uh, more pressing refugee crisis. But you'll, he'll be, you'll be hearing a lot more about Greece and, and the future of the euro as a currency in the next few months, I can tell you that because the jury is still out on that. The jury is still out on that. The euro, as we know it, may cease to exist, and I don't think I'm being uh, overly uh, pessimistic here. Uh, the EU itself, and I can't believe that I'm saying this here in Mumbai, as I was telling to you during our previous chat, if I had told an audience anywhere in the world that I'm not so optimistic anymore about the future of the EU itself, uh, you know, five, six years ago, people would have called me crazy, and rightly so. They would have said, what are you talking about? You know, like, we have crises, we get through it, uh, but the EU as a foundation cannot be touched. Its foundations, like, or its principles, such as uh, free borders, the Schengen Agreement, uh, those are firmly, you know, rooted in what we believe uh, Europe can be. Well, guess what? Borders are being closed as we speak now. 
so as you can tell, um, what started what started post World War II um, with the intentional with the intention and the purpose of preventing war again on a continent that lived through two extremely devastating world wars in a time span of 30 years with millions of people dead. Um, now, you know, is finding itself in, I believe, its most fundamental and existential crisis that it has faced since its foundation. Uh, before I get into the, the, the crisis mode, let me just say outset, and I say, said this also to my fellow panelists in Delhi at the conference. I had a, a UK member of EU Parliament uh, next to me, and as you can imagine, he, he's not the biggest fan of the EU. Um, uh, quite on the contrary, he was, he, he, you know, almost, he, you know, his statement read more like a, a goodbye statement. You know, it's almost like, you know, uh, I wanted to ask him, I'm like, I read the news every day, you talk like as if the Brexit has already taken place, you know. Maybe I missed something along the way, but, uh, so it was more like a farewell note on his part. But, um, uh, you know, I had to, I had to uh, correct him on stage because he did not get his, uh, uh, historic facts right. Uh, well, not the first time the Brits did not get the historic facts right, but that's a that's a that's a different uh, issue. Um, no, because he he kept pounding about that the EU has been overstepping its boundaries from the get go. That it was in, you know the the primary purpose to, um, to uh, for its foundation was to create a single market. Well, excuse me. I mean, of course, the primary purpose was because we in Europe had overdosed on nationalism uh, in, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, which led to two devastating world wars. And that was the main purpose of the EU, uh, you know, to check in the nationalism, to, to sort of provide a rehab center, mostly for Germany, but also for, for other European nations to come together and rebuild mutual trust. I mean, you in this part, uh, in this part of the world know very well uh, how hard it is uh, after, after you, know, um, you know, devastating armed conflict with your neighbor, how difficult it is, how slow the process is to rebuild trust again. And I commend the Observer Research Foundation uh, for its efforts uh, in the Mumbai um, a Karachi uh, initiative that you have put forth. And, you know, that just gives you an idea that the EU and its foundation was anything but a given, you know, because you were facing countries that hated each other's guts, you know, who just killed each other's young men and women uh, uh, in, in, in large numbers. And so the EU in 45, 46, 47 was not a given that it took place, that it was founded. But it was founded. And, and, uh, and now uh, I regret that the, uh, uh, and with that I come full circle to the immigration crisis now, to the refugee crisis. Now, the refugee crisis has the potential, and you see it already, to really, it's the biggest test as far as solidarity is concerned. Yes, you can always say we are 28 EU member states, and, you know, we go through, uh, thick and thin uh, when it comes down to it. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I say the refugee crisis has revealed cracks, severe cracks in that, um, in that uh, you know, structure that we call the European Union. Um, and I like to believe that the Euro crisis was the precursor for that. The Euro crisis, a lot of people uh, you know, talked about a north-south gap during the Euro crisis and the lack of solidarity on the part of the northern countries, most, uh, most notably the country that I'm from, Germany, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis and towards countries like Greece, Portugal, Spain, and so on and so forth. Uh, and what you're now seeing, what you're now seeing is that um, the, notably and most prominently the Eastern European members, such as Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, uh, uh, don't feel like, uh, you know, uh, participating in the effort of distributing the refugees among those 28 member states. Quite on the contrary, many of these uh, EU member states, such as Hungary, have categorically uh, refused uh, to take in what they see a threatening influx of Muslim migrants that they don't want to integrate into their society. Um, now, 
I, I'd like to believe that Europe is at fault here. And why do I say this? Because we could have seen this coming. The Syria crisis is not something that happened overnight. The, the war in Syria has been going on for five years. And let's be honest, and I say this very self-critically as a Euro European myself, the European Union, Germany, and all these other countries were very happy to look the other way as long as the problem did not affect them personally. Uh, we only really took interest in this conflict in Syria once the refugees started showing up. And I think now our strategy of indifference and quite frankly of an obsolete way of global thinking because in this global, in this very, in these global times, it was naive at best to think that a war in Syria that rages on for five years will not reach your borders at some point. Uh, I think we, we in Europe thought this is a Middle Eastern problem, this is a Syrian problem, this is a... Uh, uh, this is a Arab problem. This is an Arab Spring phenomenon, and it will settle at some point. Well, guess what? It did not. And with a very weak United States, um, meaning a president who has laid out its principles of leading from behind, um, and a Russian president who saw a gap for himself to reach or increase Russia's influence again in world affairs, uh, you have a very detrimental combination now where, quite frankly, including myself, I don't think anyone knows anymore what's going on in Syria on the ground anymore. Um, even the best of experts, you know, would, would, would have to pause and halt for a second to get it to tell, give you an oversight of who's fighting whom now at this point. Because I think it's clear to me that it's no longer about Syria and the future of Syria. Syria has just become a playground for so many proxy wars taking place. Sunni versus Shiite, Russia versus the West, uh, you know, Turkey versus, uh, um, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, if you will, uh, Iran and si Israel in the mix, and 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 uh, and and, um, and uh, it's a very very volatile, very volatile mix. And so, um, it is no longer a, a conflict that is and can be contained to Syria alone. And I think that makes it very serious. You can already see the tensions between Turkey and Russia. Uh, resulting from the Syrian uh, war, you see, you know, and if you know anything about NATO and Article 5, you see, you know, this can spiral into an extremely, extremely difficult and complicated conflict. If Russia were to attack Turkey and Turkey were to invoke Article 5 of the NATO uh, agreement, you know, Honest to God, I don't want to paint, out, you know, paint this picture. It's, this is worst case scenario, but it is volatile. Make no mistake about it. You have the Kurds, you have the Kurds in, in northern Syria who see their historic opportunity you know, to finally sort of cash in the promise of their own homeland, which was promised to them after World War II in the Treaty of Versailles which they missed out on. And so all of these combinations combined uh, make, make for a very volatile mix. Now, let me say a couple of sentences about the uh, immigration crisis, uh, refugee crisis in Europe and then throw it back to you. Now, right now, we have over a million, over a million of refugees have reached the shores of Europe in the past year. Uh, most of them have been taken in by a handful of countries, notably Germany, Sweden, Austria, uh, and so on and so forth. The problem is, uh, as the days go by, Germany finds itself more and more isolated. Uh, even very liberal and, and uh, helping countries like Sweden are f and Austria are saying we cannot 
uh, take this anymore for domestic political purposes. We cannot, you know, justify this anymore. We have to close our borders. Uh, Denmark is doing the same. Um, and, and Chancellor Merkel, Chancellor Merkel really is the only one still, still, who is, uh, you know, exerting leadership here uh, on this front. But make no mistake about this. With each passing day, she is facing extreme scrutiny and heat on the domestic political front as well. And just a year ago, just a year ago, if, if, if we ha would have had this talk here a year ago, I would have probably rambled on for on and on about the Euro crisis and about how Chancellor Merkel, you know, is firmly, the, 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 you know, seated in power and the most powerful politician in Europe. Well, the latter it still holds true. So the latter still holds true. Chancellor Merkel is still the most powerful politician in Europe, still the most influential one, but also increasingly the most isolated one. The most isolated one uh, in the Euro context and the most criticized one on the domestic front. And this is a dangerous phenomenon. We have three regional elections coming up in March in Germany. Three states, big states, Baden-Württemberg, Rhineland-Pfalz, they're going to go to the polls. And it's going to be the first indicator, really. It's going to be the first indicator uh, what the people will say. We, in Germany, up until recently, thankfully, and I would also argue due to our history, we have been spared, unlike France and other countries, from the rise of xenophobies, uh, xenophobist uh, racist parties. But unfortunately now, due to the refugee crisis, we have a party called the AFD, Alternative für Deutschland, translated Alternative for Germany, who is trying to cash in, who is trying to cash in with anti-refugee rhetoric. And the polls show if uh, elections were to be, uh, national elections were to be held today, they would gain about uh, 12, 13 percent of the vote. And that is extremely disheartening for a country like Germany with its history uh, and very worrisome because they would make it into parliament um, and they would, as they do already, poison the rhetoric. They poison the rhetoric already what deemed to be racist and completely, uh, I would say, politically incorrect, only up until recently in Germany, now has sickered into the mainstream of political discourse and rhetoric. You can say these things, you can say uh, Islamophobic things, you can say ex xenophobic things under the umbrella of being concerned uh, for the future and well-being of, of the nation. Um, if you're asking me how this all will play out, um, well, globally, uh, and uh, on a, well, if I had the answer, I'd be a rich man, I can tell you that. Uh, and I probably wouldn't be sitting in Mumbai, but running the country. Uh, uh, because uh, much smarter than, and women than myself are scratching their heads. Because as I said, I think the, the, the most difficult thing is, this is an issue that can no longer be contained bilaterally or whatnot. This is, this will take a bigger effort. And this, uh, and I'm not just saying it because I've uh, spent considerable amount of years in the United States. Uh, this will, whether we like it or not, and Europe is uh, to be blamed for that as well, we bitch and moan when the U.S. takes charge. But you know what? When it doesn't, we see what happens. And the lack of U.S. leadership here, of course, spurred by U.S. elections and a lame duck president who I, I, I'm afraid will not take any initiative anymore in Syria. Uh, I think he will play it out. You know, uh, you can already see uh, Vladimir Putin is, is loving it. You know, he's loving it. There's nobody to check him in. There's no Washington, there's no U.S. president to, to, you know, to warn him, to pull him back. There's no European, uh, common united front, European uh, uh, Union front to, to exert his power. Um, Europe feels that as far as uh, going against Russia, it has already done its utmost by imposing sanctions due to its uh, actions in Crimea and, and the Ukraine. Um, and... Uh, and I believe also because Russia is ailing economically due to the economic sanctions and the low uh, oil prices, um, this is a conflict that comes at a great, very good time for Vladimir Putin. 
because he can distract from the many domestic problems he has. Uh, and I think he is provoking Turkey to test Article 5, you know, and there's nothing, and, and the, f the fact already that, that uh, some, some European politicians have come out and say that, you know, sort of a, a conflict between Russia and, and, and Turkey would not uh, automatically lead, you know, to uh, uh, so, sort of an activation of Article 5 um, is, is this is what he's looking for. Uh, five, I'm sorry, uh, the Article 5 is basically if one NATO member is attacked, then, you know, it's sort of an attack on all NATO member states, and they have to, you know, assist and aid that, that country in its defense. So basically, if we want to play it out theoretically, an attack, say, uh, uh, you know, Russian plane on Turkish soil or whatnot, uh, um, a threat, an attack on Turkish soil, uh, would theoretically would lead to a common NATO response versus Russia. Uh, I can tell you this will not happen. This will not happen. Uh, and this is exactly what he's looking for, conquer and divide. You know, he's div you know, he divides, he divides Europe, he divides uh, the Western world, and he's successful. He's successful uh, with it. Um, the refugees, we think by that by giving Turkey three billion euro uh, and sort of making a couple of concessions vis-a-vis its ambitions to join the EU, uh, that will lead to Turkey sealing the border and no refugees coming into, into EU. Well, guess what? This coastline that everybody's talking about is hundreds of kilometers long. So even if uh, President Erdogan and Prime Minister Davutoglu were to be serious, were to be serious about the pledge and the agreement, you know, to do their utmost to seal the borders and not let any refugees sort of enter Europe through, through Greece. Uh, how is this going to be? It's not possible. It's logistically just not possible. And I feel that the EU, uh, most notably Chancellor Merkel, she is placing all her hope and chips on Turkey, um, a country that has already taken in two million refugees up until now. And by the way, let's not, forget, let's not forget Jordan and Lebanon. Lebanon, a country of one million people, have taken in one million refugees. Jordan, up until now, has taken in six, seven hundred thousand refugees. And I find it difficult and hard to believe and disappointing that 28 EU members, 28 EU nations, 500 million people cannot divide a million refugees amongst them. And, and this, is, this is really the lack of solidarity is what makes me at this point say, you, you know, I talk to people who are members of the EU Parliament and they tell me off the record that, yes, they are genuinely concerned about the future of the European Union. Um, and they feel that we are sleepwalking into a process that cannot be reversed easily. Um, you know, we might think that it is a temporary measure to close the borders and so on and so forth. Um, but this lack of solidarity will not be forgotten. And I, on a, I have to be very honest, I'm, a, I'm very disappointed particularly about the reaction and response on the part of Eastern European nations because they themselves, when the wall came down in 89, they were refugees themselves. And they benefited from borders being open to them and by lending help, uh, hand being, uh, being, being uh, uh, you know, reached out to them. And for them to... Uh, you know, show, show lack of empathy here is, is truly disheartening. Um, now, the Brits are, are saying, see, we told you. They're saying, we told you. This is why we didn't want to be in this in the first place, because we don't want a United States of Europe, because we always believe that it will never happen. It cannot work. And unfortunately, the, the refugee crisis is, in a way, proving them right. Um, now, of course, 
nationalism has never gone away. Uh, I mean, uh, you just need to follow the European Championship to know, you know, that uh, nationalism has never gone away. Now I understand that I'm in a, in a, in a country of, of uh, cricket, you know, <laughs> no, no, football. But, uh, you know, in, in our part of the world, uh, football reigns, it uh, reigns big. And, and uh, so, so, you know, we were never naive about the United States of Europe. But we always perceived it as a bulwark uh, against a defense mechanism against, um, you know, poisonous nationalism. You know, we believed in cooperation and solidarity. And I'm, I'm afraid that these values that the EU stands for, also hu human rights, you know, human rights, uh, lending a help to refugees, and so on and so forth. All these things that we thought, this is what Europe is, right? We, uh, we, uh, we are a continent that embraces these things and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. We are being seen put to a test, and uh, if I were to be a teacher, I would say, uh, you're not doing too well right now, you know. And Germany, and with that, with that I'll close, uh, Chancellor Merkel's stance uh, is, is really, is, it really has to be admired uh, because she's not only going against her EU partners, but she's going against, I would say, uh, the, the uh, by now, predominant public opinion. And, y you know, show me a politician who, due to personal principles, governs against public, against public opinion. Uh, that is rare in this day and age. Um, I don't know how long she can hold it up because we're going to have elections in 2017, national elections. Um, I don't see any alternative to her uh, on the Christian Democratic Union front. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's safe to predict that she will run again. Uh, this would be her uh, uh, third term. Um, and uh, it, w it, will, it will remains to be seen because this issue has the potential to shape her legacy for better or worse. And in many ways, I think it has already started to. Um, so, um, the EU is a success story. I will not let anyone tell me differently, not even a, 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 parliamentar a parliamentarian from the UK. The EU is a success story because we have not had armed conflict on our continent for 70 years. This is not a given on a continent that sort of was the impetus for two world wars. So that is not a given. And therefore I say we lived in peaceful times and prosperous times for seven decades. And therefore, regardless of what happens with the uh, refugee crisis and how it plays out, the EU for me is a success story. But if it will remain a success story, that, to be honest, I'm not sure anymore. Whether the EU will continue in the way that my generation has, been, has taken for granted, I do not know anymore. Uh, because we've had too many crises in too short amount of time, revealing cracks within the division, and, and uh, sort of putting that union in the literalist sense of the word, the union to the test. And whether we're going to succeed or fail in this test, the jury is still out. But make no mistake about it, this is the one that will define if and how the Euro European Union will exist in the years and decades to come. So with that, I will close for now. I thank you for your attention, and I'm looking for your, answer, for your questions. Thank you. Yeah.